Some stones are hard to price, not because they're rare, but because no one was supposed to find them in the first place. They don't lie in riverbeds or caves. They lie under salt, under ice, underground so hot that even satellites distort trying to map it. We've seen one sell for $40, uncut, misclassified as slag. Three years later, that same piece resurfaced in a private auction, sold for $1,000 to a collector who only said this shouldn't exist. And he meant that literally because these stones weren't shaped by time, but by the absence of everything else. Some stones are hidden not by time, but by the places no one dares to live. Scorching heat, absolute cold, no air, no water. And yet deep within these wastelands, five geological wonders were formed. Not legendary, not magical, but proof that Earth never stops building, even in its harshest corners. Here are the five. Top five, Darwin glass. Meteorite glass hidden deep in Tasmania's rainforest. It begins where most people never go. The rainforests of western Tasmania. Dense, wet, cold. Hardly the place you'd expect to find glass. And yet, 800 meters above sea level, scattered among roots and moss, lies something strange. A brittle, dark green substance. Sharp, translucent. Lighter than obsidian, but heavier than it looks. Locals once referred to it as the Devil Stone. Scientists now call it Darwin Glass. Roughly 800,000 years ago, something struck Earth near Mount Darwin. A meteorite, not massive by global standards, less than 100 meters across. However, the angle, speed, and terrain made it a catastrophic event. The heat flash instantly melted the surface rock. The blast crater, now known as Darwin Crater, measures just over a kilometer wide. But the debris field? It extends for more than 400 square kilometers, buried in rainforest soil, tree roots, and creek beds. Darwin glass formed at that exact moment. Sand, shale, and quartz were liquefied by impact, then flung into the air as molten droplets. They cooled mid-flight, forming shapes unlike any other glass on Earth. No two pieces are the same. Some are round, like frozen raindrops. Others are twisted, ribboned, and splattered into aerodynamic curves. Colors range from olive green to smoky black. Some have internal bubbles. Others contain crystalline flow bands, a fingerprint of their ballistic birth. Unlike Libyan desert glass or moldavite, Darwin glass does not originate from a desert or plain. It's hidden under leaf litter, between ferns, or embedded in muddy banks. Collectors search by hand, with trowels, with patience. Each find is brushed off with water, bagged, GPS marked, and if lucky, certified. It's not legal to extract large quantities. Tasmania's parks are protected, but small permitted finds do appear in academic collections and private trade. Scientific interest in Darwin glass intensified in the 1970s, when researchers identified its isotopic anomalies as originating from the deeper mantle beneath Tasmania. That made it more than impact glass. It became a tracer, proof that surface destruction can pull material from tens of kilometers below ground. Jewelry made from Darwin glass is rare, partly because few pieces are of gem-grade quality. Most are irregular, opaque, jagged. But when cut and polished, especially from clearer nodules, they shine with a metallic green sheen not seen in other tektites. Prices are modest, ranging from $20 to $80 per piece, depending on the shape, provenance, and translucency. But for collectors, value isn't in the price. It's in the origin. Because this isn't volcanic. It's not sedimentary. It's not even a meteorite. It's what happens in between. A second of heat, a wave of pressure, then silence. Darwin glass is that silence, shattered and left behind. Top four, blue garnet, the stone that reversed color, and logic color in gemstones is not random. It comes from trace elements, crystal fields, and atomic gaps. It follows rules, predictable, charted, and measured. But not this time. In 1996, a small parcel of garnet arrived from southern Madagascar, uncut, unassuming. Labeled pyrope spessartine, like hundreds before it, but under light, any light, it did something no garnet had ever done. 
It changed color from blue-green in daylight to purplish-red under incandescent light. Not a hint, not a tint, a full-spectrum shift, sharp, unmistakable. It was and still is the only known garnet to display actual alexandrite-like color change. Geologically, that shouldn't happen. Garnet is a solid-state crystal with tightly bonded atoms. Its color is defined by internal electron transitions, stable, predictable, Vanadium, the element responsible for color change in alexandrite, has never been known to bond in garnet in sufficient quantity to trigger a full shift. Yet here it did. The source? Bakaili, a remote commune in southern Madagascar, is positioned above one of the planet's most ancient rift zones. The crust here is fractured, tilted, and pressurized. Heat gradients vary by thousands of degrees and meters. Fluid pockets rise from the mantle through faulted peridotite. It's a geological interface, not a mine. No formal operation exists. Specimens are surface collected or dug by hand in isolated pits, which are exposed only when seasonal rains strip away the topsoil. Most garnets found here are typical, ranging from pink to orange. But occasionally, a single grain reveals a signature. Blue in daylight, red in lamplight. These aren't treated. They aren't lab-grown. They're real. Gemologically, blue garnet is classified as a mix of pyrope and spessartine with vanadium substitution. But that definition fails to capture the tension. A stone known for stability suddenly defies optical logic. The stones are small, rarely over one carat when cut. Clarity varies. Color shift ranges in intensity, and most of the rough is lost in cutting as the color zoning runs unevenly. Prices reflect that scarcity. In 2004, a 0.6 carat certified specimen sold at auction for $6,800, over $11,000 per carat. Today, clean stones over 0.5 carats command between $1,500 and $3,000 per carat, depending on origin, traceability, and chromatic strength. Few make it to market. Fewer still are recognized. Most jewelers mistake them for spinel or synthetic alexandrite. Even among collectors, blue garnet is whispered, not advertised. Because it doesn't act like garnet, and it doesn't act like alexandrite. It acts like something else. A mineral caught between rules. A formation event no one fully understands. A rift-born crystal that reflects two worlds in one. Not rare because of volume. Rare because it doesn't settle. Rare because it... Top 3. K2 granite azurite. Copper blue in a place. It shouldn't be. Some stones are rare because they're beautiful. This one is rare because it makes no geological sense. Near the base of K2, the world's second highest mountain, lies a granite formation streaked with black biotite, gray feldspar, and a mystery that still has no clear answer. Speckled across its pale surface are vivid circles of deep blue. At first glance, they look artificial, like pigment spilled on countertop stone. But under magnification, chemical analysis confirms what the naked eye suspects and geologists fear. It's azurite, a copper-based carbonate mineral, and it has no business being there. In nature, azurite forms in oxidized copper deposits, typically in arid, low-pressure environments. Granite forms deep underground, under high pressure, in acidic, copper-poor settings. The two don't coexist. Chemically, they repel each other. And yet here they are. Fused together in the same matrix, 5,000 meters above sea level, buried beneath snow and ice. The stone was first recorded by independent mineral traders in the early 2000s. Not in a formal mine, not through any government registry, but through local climbers, Pakistanis who live in the Gilgit Baltistan region, and began finding oddly patterned granite boulders while navigating glacial moraines near K2. What followed was confusion. At first, international dealers assumed the color was fake. Some accused sellers of injecting dye into white granite. Others dismissed it as a novelty with no value. Then came the lab tests. The blue was real, and it wasn't a coating or inclusion. It was crystallized azurite, forming spherical aggregates less than one centimeter wide, distributed unevenly but consistently throughout the stone. No one could explain how. Theories emerged. Hydrothermal infiltration, fault zone fluid migration, post-crystallization replacement. 
but none accounted for the clarity of the azurite or its stable shape within a matrix that had solidified millions of years earlier. The truth? The mechanism is still unknown. Access to the site remains limited. The region straddles a politically tense border between Pakistan and China. There are no industrial operations, only foot access by climbers, traders, and locals. Snow covers the region for most of the year. Glacial melt, altitude sickness, and sudden storms make collection dangerous and inconsistent. There is no mapping, no official reserve, only fragments of K2 stone carried down from the ice, each one a contradiction in mineral form. Market value varies. Rough specimens with visible blue can sell for $30 to $200. Well-cut cabochons with sharp azurite blebs have fetched up to $500, though the material is notoriously difficult to polish cleanly. Most buyers don't wear it, they frame it, because this isn't a gemstone for sparkle. It's a geological paradox, stable on the outside and structurally impossible underneath. K2 granite azurite doesn't answer any questions. It creates them, and that's what makes it valuable. Top second Jamanshin impactite, formed by an ancient blast in Kazakhstan. Not all craters leave a mark, some fade, buried under time, wind, and shifting ground. But a few leave more than a scar. They leave impact tight, glass-born stone, forged in seconds by forces Earth itself cannot reproduce. In western Kazakhstan, on the edge of the Ustjurt Plateau, lies a depression nearly invisible from the ground. The landscape is flat, sandy, and broken only by scattered shrubs and windblown rock. However, 900,000 years ago, this was the epicenter. A meteorite, estimated at 200 to 400 meters wide, entered the atmosphere and struck at hypervelocity. The heat? Over 1,800 degrees Celsius. The pressure? Enough to liquefy sand, shatter granite, and vaporize metal. What formed afterward was neither lava nor glass, but something stranger. Jamanshin impactite. Unlike volcanic rocks, impactites carry a dual identity. They're part earth, part cosmic trauma. Fragments of local minerals fused with alien energy, cooled mid-flight or mid-blast. In the case of Zhaman Shen, the result is a field of brescia, impact brescia, scattered across kilometers. Some are black and sharp, like obsidian. Others are greenish, granular, and almost foam-like in structure. The rarest contains shocked quartz, a diagnostic feature only seen in meteorite impact zones. There is no mining operation here. Only a mix of geologists, military observers, and, on rare occasions, private collectors with clearance. The site itself is still under partial restriction due to Cold War nuclear testing, which once considered Jamanshin a simulation site for nuclear impact craters. That gives the stone a second layer of tension. It was forged by impact, then studied by the threat of another. Most specimens are surface collected, no drilling, no excavation, just field surveys done in windstorms and heat waves, often above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. When found, Jamanshin impactite is rarely found to be jewel-like in appearance. It's jagged, porous, uneven. But polished fragments, especially those with glassy edges or inclusions of cosite, can be set into custom jewelry or held as scientific specimens. Value? It's not traded like gold or emeralds. However, in meteorite mineral circles, clean Jamanshin pieces with full traceability fetch $50 to $150 per specimen, with higher prices if they're part of a match crater series or contain recognizable vesicle patterns. Custom pendants, usually silver-backed, freeform, and polished, have sold for $400 or more at Impact Mineral Expos in Germany and Japan. But for most collectors, it's not about beauty, it's about origin. This isn't just stone, it's the aftermath of something Earth didn't choose. To hold a piece of Jaman Shin is to have the moment before silence, a half second when the sky struck the ground and turned soil into stone. Top 1. Libyan Desert Glass Frozen fire from Earth's hottest desert. It looks like fire frozen in time, but no volcano made this. Across the Great Sand Sea, on the border of western Egypt and eastern Libya, lies one of the most unforgiving stretches of desert on Earth. No roads, no settlements, no visible signs of life. 
just 700 kilometers of shifting dunes, where even satellite imagery struggles to track change. And buried under this silence lies glass, natural glass, formed not from lava, but from impact. Libyan desert glass is a type of impactite, a mineral formed when a meteorite collides with Earth with such force that the sand at the point of impact vaporizes and then fuses in a solid glass as it cools. No crater has ever been conclusively linked to it, which makes it even more mysterious. Theories suggest the blast happened over 29 million years ago. Temperatures reached over 1,600 degrees Celsius. What remains now are scattered shards, some no bigger than a coin, others the size of a man's palm, half buried across the desert like forgotten relics of a planetary collision. There is no official mining operation, no maps, no markers. Collectors travel days by camel or modified 4x4 to search for specimens. Metal detectors don't help. It's non-metallic. And because the color blends into the sand, most pieces are found by eye, often after sunrise, when the glass glints briefly against the dune line. What makes it valuable? First, the color. Most pieces range from pale yellow to golden amber. However, the finest specimens carry a luminous, almost fluorescent glow, especially when viewed under ultraviolet light. Some contain Le Chatelierite, a form of nearly pure silica, found only in high-temperature meteorite impacts. A few are riddled with bubble inclusions or swirl patterns that resemble slow-motion lightning trapped in stone. Second, the history. In 1922, British explorers recovered samples while surveying desert roads. But Libyan desert glass remained obscure until 1999. That year, analysis confirmed its extraterrestrial origins. And then, one more twist. In Tutankhamun's tomb, archaeologists found a carved scarab beetle amulet placed on the boy king's breastplate. That scarab, made entirely from Libyan desert glass. Today, raw specimens are traded in mineral fairs and private collections. Prices vary from $2 to $10 per gram for rough pieces to over $80 per gram for high-transparency, jewelry-grade glass. Carved cabochons and pendants, especially those over 5 carats, can fetch prices ranging from $500 to $1,200, depending on clarity and provenance. But most don't make it to stores. The difficulty of access, plus restrictions on desert exploration in Egypt and Libya, has made the supply unreliable. Some traders simply wait for years. Others never go back. Libyan desert glass is not flashy. It doesn't sparkle like a diamond. It doesn't carry the name recognition of sapphire or emerald. But hold one against the sun, and you'll see what Pharaoh saw. Not a stone, but the last breath of a falling star. Cooled in a land where time doesn't pass, it waits. If you've made it this far, thank you for spending time with the places most people will never reach and the stones that only exist because of it. Your likes and subscriptions help us keep producing stories like these. With original research, verified sources, and time spent chasing the ground beneath the surface. Next episode, we go even further, beyond deserts, beyond glaciers, to the only place where geology leaves no witnesses, the moon. Until then, stay curious.